The third and final address is on the subject of sanctification and its goal. And I'd like to read some verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 1 to 8. 1 Thessalonians 4 from verse 1. Furthermore then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honour, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. The work of God in sanctifying us has one supreme goal, and that is the glory of his name. This is so of everything. As the Apostle declares in Romans 11, verse 36, of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory for ever and ever. And that includes, of course, his work in us of sanctification. Now, that being the case, it is important for us to ever acknowledge this. If there is any good in us, how has it come about? Isaiah 26 and verse 12, For thou, Lord, hast wrought all our works in us. Our works, you see, but thou hast wrought what we have done is only because he has worked and enabled us to do it. In Philippians 2 verses 12 and 13 it says the same thing. We are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Our working out is only because of his working in. So there is that coming together, that concurrence, our working only because of God's working. So to him be the glory if anything holy is ever seen in our lives. And so it is something due from us <clears throat> as we so in the last message in John 15 verse 8, so that ye bear much fruit and my Father is glorified. Philippians 1 verse 11, as we heard also before, filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well, real gospel holiness will always move us to give God the glory, not unto us, not unto us, but to thy name give glory. False holiness will lead to pride and self-glorying, like that Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, not this, not that, and so on. And all he did was pray with himself. No real knowledge of God, full of his own holiness, supposedly, 
which was only self-righteousness. But real holiness leads to true humility, giving God the glory. Well, let us consider what God does in our sanctification in order to bring all the glory to himself. Firstly, he deals with sin in us. Sin is that abominable thing that God hates. And he teaches us to see it as an abominable thing for us to hate. It's his great enemy. Sin dishonours God. And so he deals with it in us that he might be glorified in us instead. Now in Romans 7 and verse 21, the apostle says this, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And in these words are some truths that belong to every Christian's experience and the struggle that's involved in becoming holy. You see that Paul has a good aim when I would do good. That word good is a word that stands for everything that pleases God. Micah 6 verse 8, he hath showed the old man, O man, what is good? What doth the Lord, Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God? Good. Well, by grace, Paul actively sought this, as we do. And don't we say, I would do good, only that which is good, well pleasing to him. But he experienced something contrary. When I would do good, evil is present with me. He means he is pulled the opposite way, evil. In the process of sanctification, we will find that every grace developing in us has its opposite corruption. For instance, if we exercise faith, we say, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. If we seek to love, we find hardness of heart and bitterness toward others. If we seek to be patient, we are tempted to fretfulness. If we pursue holiness of life, sin raises its ugly head. When I would do good, evil is present with me. And God deals with this. Now Paul calls it a definite thing. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Something that tries to rule us. And we find that holiness is so hard because sin is so strong. And, we f and it's something that's always there. I find, he says. That's why he states twice in Romans 7, sin that dwelleth in me. Verses 17 and 20, what we call remaining sin. Because we are regenerate, the old nature is not eradicated, it remains in us. It does not reign over us, but we know that it is present there. We are not in our sins, but sin is in us. And therefore, each of us as Christians feels two strong desires within. Paul calls them good and evil. So any progress in holiness is a struggle against the opposite. Elsewhere in scripture, he uses other terms. Spirit, flesh, Galatians 5.17. New man, old man. Ephesians 4, 22 and 24. New heart, heart desperately wicked. Ezekiel 36, 26. 
Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Two conflicting principles and powers, each working in us, competing for our obedience. And so we say that believers have two natures. By nature we mean the perspective from which we can act, the inclination we tend to follow. And so a real Christian, being sanctified, has a battle on his hands. Spurgeon puts it this way, I hold there is in every Christian two natures. There is a spiritual nature coming directly from heaven, as pure and as perfect as God himself, who is the author of it. And there is also in man that ancient nature, which by the fall of Adam hath become altogether vile, corrupt, sinful and devilish. But in spite of this, we are becoming what we are called to be. As we saw in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, and God will fulfil his will. He will not be defeated. He will not be thwarted. Sanctification is God's work in us by which we gradually are becoming more holy in heart and life and he has his glory in view as he is doing this and he is jealous for his glory and his name will be magnified dear friends in our sanctification struggle though it might be and we might fail and we might falter and we might fall but still he will deal with sin in us and holiness will come forth. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this. He empowers us to live out the Christian life, enabling us to obey the new nature. And you see there in Colossians 3, verses 8 to 10, how the Apostle puts it. He says there, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mind, mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deed, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Let's go down to verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, and so on. This has been called by someone the expulsive power of a new principle, this new nature. And the thing is, you see, we must starve the old nature and feed the new nature that the old might grow weaker in its working in us and prevailing with us and the new might get stronger and might dominate and be that which we serve. And Whitfield expresses it like this, George Whitfield, this remaining body of sin, how hard, how slow he dies, oh for a heart Gladly to embrace every cross, every trying dispensation that may have a tendency to poison or starve or nip the buddings of the old and cherish, promote or cause to bloom and blossom the graces and tempers of the new man in my soul. And so we're empowered to live out the Christian life and it becomes a very practical thing. You see, we must avoid whatever helps the old nature. It lurks there, dormant, ready to rise up, ready to feed upon whatever is provided for it. That's why Romans 13 verse 14 says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfil the lusts thereof. Now you see there's every provision for the flesh 
in this present evil world. And if we are serious about gospel holiness, we will be very careful that we don't aid and abet the old man, the flesh, in what it would love to do, which is to control us. And so we will be very careful what we see and what we receive through eye gate. Careful what we hear and listen to through ear gate. We should be careful what we read, what we encounter. We should be very careful with our internet browsing. Very, very careful. The newspapers we read, the magazines, the media that we allow ourselves. Because these things can be so many channels to provide for the flesh and its lusts thereof. You don't need me to tell you that. It's around us all the time. And Proverbs 26 verse 20 says, Where no wood is, there the fire goes out. Don't give it any fuel to burn up. Starve it. Quench it. It'll never be gone completely. But don't help it. And so yield to the new nature and its leading and provide for that instead. Because the wonderful thing about it is, while the flesh has the devil to take advantage of it, the spirit or the new nature has the Holy Spirit to help it. And the Holy Spirit is much more powerful than the devil. That's why in Galatians 5 verse 16 Paul says, Walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfil the lust of the flesh. And so of course feed the new man. Feed him with the word of God. Feed him with prayer. Feed him with closeness to Christ as we saw last time. Communion with the Saviour. Feed him with godly fellowship godly believers. Feed him with good reading material that edifies and builds up. Feed him with everything so that he'll be strong and will walk accordingly and go on in holiness. And so he, the Lord empowers us to live out the Christian life, enabling us to take these steps and he will have the glory. He will also weaken sin's power in us. In Micah 7 and verse 19 you have this promise that he shall subdue our iniquities. James Smith helpfully illustrates it like this regarding the old nature but like fire apparently quenched it will break out again and again like rebels in a state, it will seize every opportunity of disturbing the peace and happiness of the soul. Hear then what the Lord says to you, I will subdue your iniquities, carry your complaint to his throne, plead his faithful word, and expect his promised power to subdue your iniquities, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace reigns and will conquer every rival lust. And so, weakening. And then it means, of course, that the conflict keeps us humble and dependent upon him. As our Lord said, John 15, 5, without me... You can do nothing. And we will acknowledge that even what is done by his grace will never be perfect. It will always seem tainted. Even our holiness. We read in Exodus 28 verse 38 about the iniquity of our holy things. And the Lord Jesus as our great high priest bearing the iniquity, bearing them away. 
and sanctifying our holy things, making them acceptable to God, but we shall feel that our best is dyed with sin and nothing worth, as John Newton puts it. But oh, he will empower us to live out the Christian life, but we will be humble and dependent and will give him all the glory for anything and everything that is found in us. And then thirdly, dealing with sin in us, empowering us to live out the Christian life, he will make sanctification a blessing to us and be glorified that way. We know, don't we, that sin brings sorrow. Holiness brings happiness. Elisha Coles, an old divine, wrote, Holiness hath in it a natural tendency to life and peace. There is about a life conformed to the will of God that is restored to the image of God to a great degree and it's like a relic of paradise. It's like back there in the Garden of Eden when Adam walked with God before the fall and there was life and health and peace, a quiet conscience, a cheerful heart, an optimistic outlook. It even promotes good physical health, doesn't it? All other things being equal, of course. But in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost and indwelt by the Spirit and the union and communion with Christ, as we've been hearing about earlier. It produces this uh, healthy, healthy body and mind. Proverbs 3, verses 7 and 8. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. You can tell the difference between sin and holiness and the effects of either. Sadly, someone who's unconverted and gives way to sin, there's such degeneration and dissipation in their life. It produces such chaos in their affairs and chaos in the affairs and lives of others who have anything to do with them. It's just all tangled in a mess and premature aging through excess, mentally, physically. But a godly, holy person, such peace, so conducive to good health, mental health, physical health, such a blessing to all around, very different. I remember some years ago visiting one of our people from here in Hollywell Evangelical Church in hospital. And he was an elderly man in his 80s. And there was in the same ward in another bed a much younger man whom he had been associated with in his place of work. This man, the first man, a dear godly man, a beloved brother, this other man was unconverted and had led a dissolute, wicked life. And I tell you, this man in his 80s looked younger than this much younger man in the other bed, the sinner. There was about this first man, our dear brother, a, a softness, a sweetness, a peace. And this other man, hard and lined and pale and miserable. Holiness produces good health in, a, in every way. I say all other things being equal. I know there can be uh, other causes for ill health, but it tends to good health under God. And it keeps us from the harm that sin does this blessing of sanctification, and all for the glory of God. The way of transgressors is hard, 
And oh, we see evidence of it, don't we? But whenever he brings us to repentance over our sin, we'll find there's nothing lost, but everything gained. We've lost what might have hurt us, and we've gained what's only a blessing when we're recovered, when we're restored, when we're quickened in God's ways. William Jenkin, the Puritan, said, There is nothing destroyed by sanctification but that which would destroy us. You needn't worry about what you might lose through being on the Lord's side and on the highway of holiness. Keeps you from the harm that sin would do us. And he has all the glory in his becoming sanctified people. And then fourthly, he is glorified by the fact that our testimony to the gospel is so enhanced by a holy life. What a powerful testimony to the truth is godliness, Christ-likeness. Titus 2 verse 10, not purloining but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. Meaning, make it an ornament, make it a thing of beauty. And you see, a, a truly Christian life beautifies the gospel, doesn't it? And in our witness, our preaching, people might reject our message and disbelieve the truth but they can't gainsay a changed life, a consistent, upright life, something of beauty and something that's charming to them, even though part of them hates it and rejects it, yet another part perhaps is drawn to it. Why are these people the way they are? What makes them like this? How it enhances the testimony of the gospel. There's a saying uh, concerning inconsistent Christians and the world looking on. I can't hear what you say for seeing what you are. How many would-be Christians have been put off by the bad standards of professing Christians, by the behaviour of them, the way they engage in their relationships to others, the way they treat people, the, the way they speak, their abrupt manner, their selfishness, worldliness, steering near to the wind in terms of worldliness. Oh, how sad this is. But this testimony to the gospel by anything like a holy life is so powerful. And of course it applies to ministers supremely. Robert Murray McShane, the Scots minister in the 19th century, one of the holiest ministers that ever was, he said some memorable words. He said, it is not great gifts that God uses, but great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. And McShane said in another place, he said to his people, the best thing you can ask God for in your prayers for me is for my holiness. 2 Timothy 2 verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. More important than great speaking gifts, eloquence, fluency, scholarship, academic attainments, people, skills, all the rest of it, though these have their place, but more important than gifts is grace. More important than abilities and attainments is holiness. What an enhanced testimony to the gospel when the one who preaches it gives evidence of its impact 
in his life. Pray that the Lord will make all of us ministers to be such ministers. And then fifthly and lastly, dealing with sin in us, empowering us to live the Christian life, making sanctification a blessing, enhancing the gospel testimony. God is glorified as the goal of sanctification by bringing us safely to heaven. One day we shall all be everything we wish to be. And that goal is glory. It will not always be the battle when I would do good, evil is present with me and so on. The two natures, the struggle, won't always be like that. Our old nature never weakens. And we who are older in years find in fact that sometimes it can come forth with even greater power. And as one's faculties of mind perhaps weaken, become infirm, bodily powers decay a little, that old man can come forth with such renewed force to take advantage. And older believers struggle with sin perhaps more than they did when they were younger. No, the, the old nature will never weaken, but the motions of sin can be weakened. And every victory reminds us that one day there is the final victory. It's like Saul's kingdom and David's kingdom. 2 Samuel 3 verse 1. Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And Matthew Henry the commentator comments like this. The contest between grace and corruption in the hearts of believers who are sanctified but in part may fitly be compared to this recorded here. There is a long war between them. The flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. But as the work of sanctification is carried on, corruption like the house of Saul grows weaker and weaker while grace like the house of David grows stronger and stronger till it come to a perfect man and judgment be brought forth unto victory. And dear friends, in death, we leave our old nature behind with the body and we are perfected in holiness and we enter heaven and that is glory. And afterwards, when our Lord returns, our body shall be raised, made like unto his glorious body and body and soul together in one shall be a perfect entity of perfect holiness. And as Isaac Watts puts it in his hymn, Sin, my worst enemy before, shall vex my eyes and ears no more. My inward foes shall all be slain, nor Satan break my peace again. Then shall I see and hear and know all I desired or wished below. And every power finds sweet employ in that eternal world of joy. Safely to heaven, we can say that in the matter of holiness, regeneration begins it, sanctification matures it, glory will complete it. And it will be like Proverbs 4 and verse 18, the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And when he has brought us safely to heaven, perfected us in holiness, in glory forever, he will have all the glory of it. That is the goal. As far as we're concerned, heaven. 
and the completion of sanctification, as far as he is concerned, the glory of his great and gracious and saving name. Well, may the Lord make these things ours throughout life and throughout all the eternity to come when we shall see his face in righteousness. Amen.